Oh, sorry. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our latest installment in the Gaelic for Mothers and Others webinar series sponsored by our program sponsors, Sports Direct. Um, we are delighted to have everybody joining us this evening um, for what is our second of the year, um, our second of six. So they will be going in um, in every other month, so to speak. So our next one is going to be uh, in May. And for anybody who missed the previous recordings, I would have sent them out to your coordinator, so make sure you catch up on those. They're all on YouTube as well. So um, kicking off this evening, um, the topic of this evening's um, webinar is tackling the menopause play on. Don't worry, uh, I'm not presenting this um, as I don't have any knowledge of the subject whatsoever. Um, but I am delighted um, to be joined by our guest presenter, Elizabeth Cullerton Quinn. Elizabeth is, I'm sure, going to do her own introduction uh, in a minute or two. But just to um, give a bit of a bit of background on this one, um, obviously, when we are looking at our topics of what we feel um, are relative to our participants um, and our specific cohort of, of players that we have taking part in our games and it's specifically in the Gaelic from Others and Others programme. This topic um, cropped up quite a bit um, and we wanted to find the most appropriate person with um, vast knowledge on the subject. So we were delighted then to be able to chat to Elizabeth um, over the last few weeks and uh, she kindly agreed to come on this evening and um, deliver the webinar for us. So um, I really hope that you enjoy it. Um, I'm going to hand over to Elizabeth in uh, two seconds and um, I will be monitoring the chat as well. Um, so please keep your questions till the end um, or if you do have a question, type it in the chat and we will get back to it at the end. So um, I'm going to hand over to Elizabeth and um, I am going to sit in the background. So I can just page down when really. Yeah. How do I move? Can, I'll just, you, you should, not, it's not working. You arrow to the right the should change it. Through options. Nope. Arrow to the right. My, my, my screen covering it. Is it something? Uh, nope. No arrow. <laughs> there you go. You're on the okay. next slide. Okay. Are you, you're doing that, are you? Or is that me? That was you. Okay, not sure how, but anyway, let's go. Okay, well, you're very welcome this evening. That's a, a good start, but um, obviously I'm not the techie wizard, but um, Vinny's here to help. So um, I suppose some of you maybe are approaching the menopause or some of you are in the middle of the menopause or some of you are on the other side of the menopause. And um, just maybe to introduce myself, as Vinny said, um, my name's Elizabeth. I'm a clinical physiotherapist. I work in the area of women's health and um, in particular pelvic floor health. And I will talk about that a little bit. Um, I also work in Trinity College uh, in the discipline of physiotherapy and occupational therapy. And my research is in the area of continence and uh, women's health. And I am working with some of the county athletes at the moment and um, really enjoying working with them. So we're looking at that too. Um, what I am not um, is I'm not a dietitian. I'm not an endocrinologist or a GP or a gynecologist, but I, I'll answer those questions as best I can. But one thing I am is I am also that soldier. I'm obviously one of those um, menopausal. I think I'm probably the other side, but um, certainly menopausal. So um, again, just click there, do I? It's not really working for me. It's at the bottom, is it? I click, it doesn't really go. Oh yeah, it is. Excellent. There we go. Um, okay, so what's the going to be on the webinar? So what we're going to talk about is what is menopause. And of course, probably you, a lot of you already know what it is, um, but we're going to talk about it um, a little bit more technically and um, talk about the symptoms. And again, many of you already know those symptoms, you're experiencing them. But we're going to talk specifically about what the effect is on the musculoskeletal system. So that's your bones, your joints, your muscles and um, what we can do about it. And being um, active and playing in the Gaelic, um, ladies Gaelic football is fantastic. Um, but I'll talk about a little bit more about that later. And then I'll answer any questions to the best of my ability. I think there we go. Now, this is a long, boring slide, but it's it, that previous slide, actually. So it well, doesn't matter. I'll, you miss it. It's the WHO definition. And basically, it talks about what's happening at menopause. So we, we're losing our um, our cycle of periods, our, um, our the 
our ovary function, we start to go into perimenopause. And perimenopause is a, a stage that is, people talk about five years, but it can start in your 30s and it can carry on way beyond the five years after we've gone through the menopause. So it's a long period of time. Um, and I think the main thing is to look at this is things are changing. I got this slide from my friend Fiona that quite liked it. The interesting thing is that um, those two groups of ladies are actually the same age. So we are younger longer. Um, I'm not saying that I look anything like the Sex and City ladies, but um, I think I'd like to stay young for longer. So we're, we're living longer. Um, the other thing as well, if we look at the, the um, statistics in 2021, women over the age of uh, 50 accounted for 26% of women and girls globally. So we're living longer. So we need to have a healthier and um, better quality of life. Okay, so signs and symptoms, as I said, you're probably familiar with many of those signs and symptoms, um, but just to run through them. And sometimes some of the symptoms that people are getting, they don't realize that it is menopause. Now, we don't write everything down to menopause, but there are some symptoms that we're maybe not aware that could be caused due to our changes in our hormones. Um, so we know that our periods change and, and in many ways we don't miss that part. Um, but our mood does change. Um, cortisol um, uh, rises with more stress, we can be more irritable, we can have more anxiety, more depression. Now, not everyone gets all the symptoms, but these are part, part and parcel of the menopause. Um, we all hear about brain fog and forgetfulness, and we've, many of us have experienced that. Um, again, the one that's probably most commonly associated is the hot flushes or hot flashes and, you know, the duvet on, duvet off, and that interrupts our sleep. But in addition to that, um, we get sleep disturbances anyway due to the menopause. So, and sleep is really important for your brain health, for your general well-being, as well as your mental health and for exercise too. So exercise can help sleep as well. Um, we might notice as well that um, we start getting a few more um, cardiac um, symptoms, some palpitations, and that can be a symptom of the menopause. But if you have any concerns about cardiac function, then please do go and talk to your GP or your doctor, um, because up to menopause, we actually have um, a benefit over the over our, our uh, male colleagues because we have protection of our, our cardio, cardiovascular system because of our estrogen. We lose that after the menopause. So, um, but palpitations can be something that's associated with the changes in hormones too. The genital urinary um, problems, so that's gentle, sexual, your pelvic floor problems, and we talk about urinary incontinence. I'm going to spend a slide or two talking about that, but that's obviously because it's my main area. Um, but I want to talk about that. Now, estrogen um, plumps up our tissues. So um, even around our pelvic floor, and um, we're going to have changes in our muscles. And we'll talk about the changes that happen within muscles. And your pelvic floor is a muscle like, like any other muscle. But also, um, estrogen plumps up the tissues, and especially around that pelvic floor region or on the soles of your feet. And that keeps um, you know, your vaginal area closed and fuller, and your, again, your anal sphincter and your, your urethra. So it helps you stay more content. So we lose some of that, um, that effect as well as our muscles changing um, during the menopause. So that's why pelvic floor dysfunction starts to become a bit more obvious. And sometimes when you maybe have had children, and you've had a, a forceps and assisted delivery or a large baby, and you maybe not have noticed too many signs of con incontinence. You start to notice it around menopausal years, and that's because, as well as the changes in, in our hormones, so therefore the changes in our muscle function, we also start to notice some of the, the effects that may have happened around delivery because our tissues aren't as, as full as well. So we can get vaginal atrophy and dryness. And again, people can use um, lubricants for that uh, or vaginal estrogen. Um, and we can get change in our sexual uh, function as well. So it's all a very pretty picture, isn't it, the menopause? But there are things we can do about it. So, so talking a little bit more about um, the science and symptoms, what goes on with our musculoskeletal system. So our joints, our muscles, our bones. Um, I don't know if you notice that um, maybe increasingly with your friends, if you're around that perimenopausal, pre or postmenopausal, you start noticing people get a few other joint problems and even things like tendonitis. So maybe your Achilles tendon 
gives you trouble or you start getting frozen shoulders or you start with the first it's the neck and then the shoulder and then the elbow and the wrist so it, you're more likely to get uh, inf inflammatory changes that happen in your ligaments and your tendons and again that's due to estrogen and um, so we are more likely to have inflammation we're more likely to have joint pain we're more likely to start getting our frozen shoulders and we're more likely to get in our tendonitis uh, and, and tendinopathies around your hamstring injuries so these are all things you need to look at, out for your feet and your hamstrings um, during your sporting activity too so uh, and you might have noticed as well um, your feet. Um, I think if we go um, to weddings or we go to anything um, that's slightly more fancy, we were if we're wearing heels. I don't know if anyone else notices during the menopause as you're approaching menopause or beyond that um, it can be harder to stand for longer on a pair of high heels. I know we're used to having more comfortable shoes nowadays, which is great and, and they're a lot more glamorous. But um, if we're in a heel, we get a lot more pressure on our feet. And again, remember that plumping of the tissue around the pelvic floor, that also happens in the soles of your feet. So our soles of our feet aren't quite as padded. So some of you may have had plantar fasciitis um, and that can be associated with the inflammatory changes and the lack of, of uh, padding on soles of our feet. So I'm going to say to you, keep your feet happy. And um, that also affects your pelvic floor function if your feet are well supported too. So good football, good footwear when you're playing your sport is really important. So having well, you know, well fitted shoes so they haven't got a loose heel. So your heel's not slipping in and out because you're going to get an Achilles tendinopathy and that can happen to you there or that you've got enough padding. So not very flat unsupported runners so you need some kind of um, sole that has a little bit of a shape to it and a little bit of padding in it and that suits you. So keep your feet happy. You can do exercises. And for those of you who've uh, had plantar fasciitis, you probably have done some exercises, some nice calf stretches to stretch out the muscles that go blend into the soles of your feet and to roll the soles of your feet as well. On And maybe a tennis ball and to do some stretches. So you can have a look at those if you're starting to find your feet are giving you trouble. But when you're playing your sport, have good shoes. Um, so what's happening here it's all about the homes so it's all about estrogen and testosterone but mostly estrogen for for us but testosterone does affect your ability to for muscle strength and various different functions but for us it's mainly our estrogen deficiency we lose the protection of estrogen on our cardiac function we've mentioned that before we had that about that benefit up to menopause we start losing that um it's also our muscles get weaker now They've done studies and they've looked at the changes in muscle. So actually for women, we start to lose some of our muscle fibers and muscle function around 30. Uh, men, don't, that doesn't start till 40. Um, but it, it starts to change a lot more dramatically around menopause. So estrogen is very protective of muscle strength and, and muscle function. And we start to lose some of that. Um, we also put on weight. That isn't um, something that we just notice. It, we actually physically do lay down more fat. It's only about 2% per year but we also lose some of our lean muscle by about 0.5% per year. So it's only small, but it gradually will build up. So it's really important to you staying active to mitigate that. And again, um, daily football, fantastic. We'll talk about that again. Um, bone density. So I'm going to talk about bone density and I'll have a slide or two on that because it's really important that we protect our bones for looking to the future. Um, so your bone health, um, if, it, if you have any effects, we get what's called osteoporosis and you're more likely to fracture and you're more likely to have hip fractures or spinal fractures or wrist fractures as we age. And we want to protect ourselves for a good, uh, healthy, good quality of life long into the future. So we need to look after our bones. And this is really affected during menopause. Um, so just to be careful of that. Um, so that's how estrogen levels is simplistic, but we fill up until we're about 30. Uh, 40 we start to drop a little and then you can see how dramatically we lose our estrogen so it, it's not good we need to um, benefit, help our bodies in other ways and also exercise can actually um, support some estrogen as well so if we look quickly at endocrinology means study of your hormones and you know your metabolism um, there's been studies done on athletes and going through the menopause and the effect of exercise and also the combination of exercise and HRT. And um, the certainly menopause, is, as we've said, is associated with an increase in fat mass and body fat. 
Um, and the HRT is associated with the lower fat mass and body fat. So there's some protection from HRT. And athletes themselves, they have low body fat mass because of their activity. And also the runners as well, these are um, uh, these are research um, following some runners. So it, it depends on the level of activity you're doing as well. But um, they also seem to have better insulin sensitivity and that's related to diabetes. So you're more likely to have um, a healthier, longer life without diabetes. So um, HRT is also associated with uh, better sensitivity for insulin. So less likely to get diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And estrogen also, once you're doing a certain level of physical activity, um, research has indicated that estrogen levels actually go up after your activity. So for, for a short period of time, you get a boost in your estrogen level. So exercise is good. So the general benefits of exercise uh, during the menopause. Well, these are general benefits that we find anyway, but they're particularly important around this time. So we know it improves mood. And there's a, there is an increase in anxiety and depression around the menopause years. And again, that's our changing hormones. And so exercise can help um, mitigate that to some extent. Um, we get better sleep quality. Again, our sleep has been disturbed. Um, physical health, our bones, um, we can help promote bone strength, um, prevent osteoporosis, um, help our heart health, because again, we've losing that protection of estrogen. And again, keep our muscles strong and strong women live longer. It also helps our cognition and uh, the oxygenation helps with our memory and also um, reduced stress helps with memory as well. Cortisol is not good for your brain. Um, so by reducing stress or exercise, you'll help with um, lower your cortisol levels too. So um, what am I saying about exercise? Well, what you're doing is fantastic and I will we'll go a little bit more specific on that in a minute. But main thing is to make it multimodal. So what does multimodal mean? It means just different types. And um, so it's a combination of things rather than just doing the one thing. So to have some aerobic fitness and um, to do strength training and um, more and more um, it's recommended that people do, are doing strength training and resistance work um, and to keep yourself nice and flexible. Um, so obviously that you're not losing your joint range, range of movement and that you keep your balance uh, strong. Now, muscle strength is associated with balance because if we look at as we age again, and we're looking to the future. We want to be strong. We want to uh, avoid falls. Our quad strength, so our, uh, our thigh muscle strength is inversely related to falls. So in other words, the stronger our quads are, the less likely we are to fall. And if we don't fall, we don't fracture. Um, and we also have to have strong bones. So keep the exercise doing different things. And I'll talk about different ways of exercising now shortly. Okay, so we'll talk about bone health for, for a slide or two, because um, I think it's really important. Um, around the time of menopause, that's where you really need to work on protecting your bone. Because if you if you remember the, the graph, or maybe you haven't shown the graph yet, actually, um, we, we'll talk about the the rapid decrease that we get around menopause in our, in our um, bone density. So on my screen, it's on the left of my picture, you can see a DEXA scan unit. Um, I don't think we all need to get um, DEXA scans. Um, they measure your bone density and compare you to what, what happens at, to a young adult um, and we compare to the mean. So we get a score based on that and it'll give us an indication whether at risk of fractures or not. So whether at risk of osteopenia, where our bone density is starting to drop off a little bit, but we're not at fracture risk or we're actually at risk of osteoporosis where we can fracture. So um, there isn't a, a screening program. And I think that a lot of people don't necessarily need to be screened. They, they look after their bone health. But if you have certain risk factors, it may be worth checking it out. Um, so if there's a strong family history of osteoporosis, um, think of checking it out. If you have absorption, malabsorption issues, maybe celiac or other um, Crohn's or other conditions that um, make it difficult to absorb calcium again, there's a high risk if you've been treated for cancer um, and you've had a lot of steroids or other, other reasons why you've had a lot of steroids for different conditions, they're more likely to um, put you at risk of osteoporosis. So um, have a look at the risk factors and maybe think about whether you want to get a screen at some point as well. But menopause is a risk because we start dropping off and we can mitigate it through exercise. So low levels of estrogen and for men, low levels of testosterone, they're going to lessen your, your bone density. Um, 
good lifestyle, so good physical activity, good diet, and um, vitamin D, really important. It's important for lots of things, but it's certainly important here because you can be taking lots of calcium, having good calcium in your diet and insufficient vitamin D, you're not going to absorb your, your um, calcium. Vitamin D is also good for joints, for brain health, uh, and for rheumatological and, and, mus and also neurological conditions. So make sure maybe you get your vitamin D levels checked as well. So that's one of the areas um, that you need to keep an eye on. So this is a bit boring. Um, it's, a, it's a slide I would put up for students, but um, bear with me for one minute. Um, if you can see that slide, if you can see that uh, bright blue line that's going first clear across the bottom third of the screen, that's the fracture threshold. We want to stay above that. You can see a yellow graph and a red graph. The yellow is the men, the red are the women. Now you can see there that we gradually increase our bone density and then the middle section there is around, we've got most of it by the time we're 20, but between 30 and 40, we're consolidating and we're, we're staying about the same. We can change it up and down a little, but more or less the same. But you can see what we have in that middle section is what we have in our bank, so our bone bank. So it's our peak bone mass. And men, as you can see on the yellow line, start with more bone in the bank than, than we do. We've got a lower peak bone mass. So as we start to decline, everything after 40 it does seem to be sometimes all downhill after 40, but we can influence it. So as we decline, we want to slow down that rate of decline. So we want to stay away from that fracture threshold. But have a look at that um, purpley blue rectangular box around 50 for women. And that's menopause. And look what happens to our bone density in menopause. It drops dramatically. Now it plateaus out again after those that critical five years. But this is where we need to be very careful with our bone health around that menopausal time, around those five years, um, because we, we drop off in our bone density there. And so we need to be really careful as well. So what do you need to do to keep your bones strong? OK, so you can either do weight bearing exercise or you can do resistance work or you can do a combination of both. So research has looked at both individually and together and has shown that um, even individually, those exercise types of exercise will improve your bone health slightly and certainly can slow down that rate of loss and keep your bones much stronger. So weight bearing means um, running, jumping, you know, moving around. Um, when you're running, if you go out for a jog, you'll get um, bone benefits for about the first 10 minutes of the run. After that, your bone gets used to the, the stimulus and you don't get it too much more bone laid down unless you change in, into interval running or run up some steps. You carry on getting cardiovascular benefits, but you're not getting bone benefits. So what you'd like to do for bone is have um, exercise that you stop and start and you, um, you move around because bone likes to be surprised to keep being stimulated. So Gaelic football, fantastic, because you're stopping, you're starting, you're sprinting, you're running, you're turning. It's constantly stimulating your bone. for it. So the weight bearing exercise, Gaelic football is fantastic. So, um, and also what you'll find is that um, wherever you stress the bone, that's where it's going to respond. So if you're mainly doing something through your lower limbs, you're running and it's coming through your, your hips, or maybe some golf going through your spine, wherever you load, it's going to respond. So if you were just running and doing some other sport, you wouldn't get the they benefit through your upper limbs. But in Gaelic, um, what you're doing, you're using upper limb and lower limb. So you're getting benefits both to your, your upper limbs and your lower limbs. So again, it's a fantastic exercise for, um, for bone health. If you want to do the, the strength and resistance part, it's a little bit more technical. So you can, so if those of you who are familiar with gyms and maybe some of the fixed weights where you, you know you press with your, your legs for the quads or you're moving the, the resistance bands or the, the bars and you can see the weights being lifted so you work out where you're at uh, for your strength so what you need to do is work out what your one repetition maximum is and you need help probably within the gym someone would be there to support you but it is a little bit more technical so your one repetition maximum is the most you can lift or press um just about comfortably that you wouldn't like to do a second and then what you do is you bring it down to 80 percent of that and you can do three sets of eight to ten repetitions of that 80% and um, one repetition maximum. Did that three times a week and you get uh, significant improvements in bone density. So research has shown it's actually, it doesn't take that long to get the bone benefits by resistance work. So it's only short about, but you have to be quite technical. Don't start at 80%. 
start about 50 or 60 and build up. It takes you um, a little while to build up to that 80 percent um, because obviously you don't want to injure yourself. But three times a week, resistance works. Um, resistance exercise works for bone health. And there's been studies showing that. But also the weight bearing works, too. And since you're doing that, um, you're you're actually at a great benefit there. So it's good. So now about the muscles, we'll talk about the muscles a bit more and we'll talk about the joint health. So remember, I said you're more likely to get joint pain. And um, so sometimes people get these, you know, they think they get arthritis and because they get now maybe sometimes people are, but other people get these aches and pains. And it's again around the menopause, it's the changes in estrogen and we get inflammation in our uh, ligaments and tendons and we, we start getting um, problems as well. Our muscles also lose uh, their mass too. So what's sarcopenia? Sarcopenia is the term for a weakening of muscle. Um, and estrogen, again, it's all about estrogen. It's really important for muscle strength. Um, so when we lose our estrogen, um, we get a reduction in our muscle strength. We get uh, our muscle quality isn't as good and it doesn't perform quite as well. So it's really important to keep what we have really strong and really functioning. Strong women live longer. Um, so this is a busy slide, but again, just bear with me. So what exercise is good for strength and fitness? Um, again, remember we talked about multimodal, doing some aerobic work, doing some strength work. So we are certainly moving into saying do a little bit more strength work. And it's not just those little light uh, weights that you see um, on pictures. We're talking about a bit more resistance than that. But strength training, we tend to say make it functional. And you may be doing some of this in your training where you're doing squats and lunges um, as you're doing exercise as well and using your body weight resistance there. You can do it free with no weights. You can do it at home. You can do it on the football uh, field. You can do it in the gym. You can then start to add weights into it um, and to increase the, the resistance and make the, the, it harder. But you've got to get the technique right and, and make sure that you can do the, the, the lunges and the squats. We have a little bit more conversation about um, the prolapse. It's not as it's not as simple um, that you take some pelvic floor, but the research is starting to indicate that if you have strong arms and legs, you're not going to be putting a lot of pressure down through the, the pelvic floor because your arms and legs should be doing the lifting rather than increasing the abdominal pressure. So some of the research is saying we can do a little bit more than we think. Sometimes not, maybe not going into a deep um, squat lunge, but we've got to have a strong enough pelvic floor to do it. And we've got to make sure our legs and arms are getting stronger. So you do it gradually, you build it up, but um, strength training is actually really important. And we can do that on, on the pitch. We can do that uh, separately too. So uh, yeah, we emphasize the strength. Plyometrics, you're probably aware of what that is. That's kind of your bouncing type exercise, your sudden springing. That's really good. It's good for your bone density and it's good for uh, muscle strength and fitness as well. So using again upper limbs and lower limbs, making sure that we do both. Um, so skipping, squat jumps, your burpees, um, your overhead throws, your chest throws, step hops, all of those. And again, we start it slowly and we, we gradually introduce different components of it because obviously an elite athlete can do so much more um, than many of us, but we can introduce um, a certain amount of it and build it up then beyond that. So hit and sit. So high intensity exercise and sprint intensity, again, rather than if we want to kind of get fit as well, rather than just increasing the distance of a run or, you know, making us run longer, or more laps or more distance, interval training has, has better effects. We also take longer to recover. So we, we're, it's much better that we use the, the uh, interval training to get our fitness up and get our strength up. So what you do is you, you're probably familiar with this, but you warm up for a while first. And then what you do is you do um, short bouts of you know, hard work. So sprinting or fast cycling or on the, the uh, cross trainer, you know, you sprint quite hard for about 30, 40 seconds. And then you take it easier to slow a pace for about a minute or two. And then again, you're back to the fast. So it's, it's fast, short, fast, short, fast for a number of cycles between five to 10 times. So you can do that quite easily, but it's really good for building up your strength and also um, your, your speed and your endurance and stamina as well. So um, you're probably doing that and um, kind of um, the shuttle runs from the back of the, the, the running around the field and uh, kind of the sprint runs across and jogging then sprinting and jogging and sprinting. That's really good uh, for building up your strength and your fitness as well. 
So um, if you if you tend to walk more again, if, say if you're going walking to I live in a village again, you can you know choose a point where you're walking, then you walk faster to a point and then you can do, you know, scouts pace, run 20, walk 20 and then you bring it to a jog to a sprint and you can bring it to different ways, uh, um, cycling, etc. Okay, so go back, sorry, go back again. So um, this is what we talk about plyometrics now, obviously very agile. Um, those, those high jumps there, um, interval training, whether you're sprinting, so you jog sprint, and then using um, squats and, and lunges, making your, your resistance work quite functional as well. And just remember, good footwork, keep those feet happy. So we're coming towards the end, but I want to talk a little bit about pelvic floor as well. I know it's my thing, but I think some a lot of women um, limit their exercise um, around this time because of the pelvic floor. They're starting to notice they have certain issues with uh, with with the bladder, so either urgency or some incontinence. And I'm going to talk about some of those conditions and how we might address it as well. So this is standing side on. Okay, you can see at the back there, the tailbone, the coccyx, you can see my cursor moving and your pubic bones at the front. And we're looking at the side of the uh, side of the leg there. And your pelvic floor is like a hammock from the, um, the coccyx to the pubic bone and it's a hammock underneath. Now, there's different layers and different parts to it and um, different muscles will control each opening underneath, but generally they'll work together and help support underneath. There's a normal spring in your pelvic floor. If it's very weak, it can sometimes give way. If it's very tight, it doesn't move in a functional way neither. So we need a normal amount of movement in our pelvic floor when we increase the pressure or when we're moving or when we're exercising. So we talk about keeping that strong as well. So the different types of symptoms. So some of you may be um, familiar with some of these um, urinary incontinence. So what stress urinary incontinence? That's where if we cough or sneeze, or during exercise, we're putting stress on the pelvic floor. If it's weak, it'll give way. If it's too tight, it'll open. So we need to have a normal, strong, functional pelvic floor. So that's stress incontinence. Uh, urgency or urge urinary incontinence, um, what that is, is where you get the urge to go to the toilet and you feel you're not going to get there in time. And I'm sure many of us have found ourselves crossing our legs and, and rushing to the bathroom. Um, but that's urgency. And, and then urgency urinary incontinence is actually when we start to, to leak on our way to the bathroom as well. So we'll talk a bit about that. You can have problems with the pelvic floor uh, because our muscles are thinning same way as any other muscle and also if the tissues are less plump so that can happen around the, the back passage or can happen less support so we get more likely to have prolapse and then some people have got very tight pelvic floors they have pelvic floor pain um so i'd love to be able to say this is this is what we do and um, these are the exercises let me talk it through then it will give you the exercises to do and you learn how to do them you can use little indicators to tell you whether you're doing them right or not um, and for many people, they just need to do uh, strengthening. So the pelvic floor muscle training might be strengthening. But for some people, uh, if they have a tight pelvic floor, for them, they need to do the opposite. So they would need to do some stretches. So we, we teach people to release the pelvic floor, to do stretches around uh, the pelvic region. And um, so around the hips to, to help stretch the hips, around the lower tummy to help stretch and around the glutes as well. And, and people who have very tight pelvic floors might note some um, sensitivity in their bladder or feel like they're not completely emptying or not completely emptying their bowel properly or they may have always noticed that having a smear is really uncomfortable or um, you know sexual function um, was could be uncomfortable or using a tampon so if that's the case then it could be that the, your pelvic floor is actually too tight rather than too weak so it's more common that it's too it's got weak but if it is too tight, again, you would need to get some advice and stretches. So again, that sh you shouldn't put up with that. That can be treated. So what I'm going to say to you here is that um, pelvic floor issues are treatable. Um, it's, it is tend to, does tend to be women's health physiotherapists, um, but there is quite specialist. So if you go to the Irish Society of Charter Physiotherapists website and look for find a physio and then the drop down menu will let you look for a women's health physio who treats contents or pelvic floor issues in your area. So if you're having lots of problems, make sure you do get get help. And there are there are now gynecological walk in menopause clinics Um, you can get some referrals in referrals into the public system and the, the private practitioners then on on that list too so what i'm saying is it's a treatable condition don't put up with it and don't just wear a pad and put up with it 
So let me give you some general advice. So when you go into the toilet, make sure you sit down and relax, that you empty your bladder. Don't be rushing. Fluids, uh, probably a lot of you are aware of this, but certain fluids are good, certain flu fluids are not so good. When you're exercising, it's good to drink uh, water especially, but drink it throughout the day rather than large volumes at a time. So sipping water throughout the day, litre, litre and a half, is, is good to keep your fluids up. Obviously, the more elite athletes, the more fluid they take. Um, so coffee, tea, alcohol, sugary drinks, orange juice, so anything that's acidic, um, fizzy, um, or caffeinated, that's a bladder irritant. So avoid drinking too much or too little. I'm not going to say to people don't drink in coffee, but don't overdo it. Um, and you find your you find your threshold. Um, pelvic floor exercises if you need them, whether they're relaxation exercises or more commonly strengthening exercises. So that's muscle training. Heavy loads. Um, again, we, it's a bit of a con controversial one whether or not we do put pro pressure to, uh, on the pelvic floor and it's weak uh, and we're more likely to prolapse but I would say it's important to have um, a strong pelvic floor and then but if we get strong legs and strong arms we're not putting pressure there we're, we're using our arms and legs so it's a little bit controversial there and I'm happy to take questions on that um, heavy loads if you're going to lift um, you, you could just do a quick tighten of your pelvic floor and a quick what we call the neck. So you tank quickly pelvic floor, keep a nice tight squeeze as you're moving something. And again, that's a protective mechanism there as well. So it's supporting. And, and people find with a mild prolapse, they often find if they strengthen up the pelvic floor, they'll feel the symptoms of the prolapse a lot less because they feel more supported. There's more support underneath, basically. Constipation strain, not good. Um, you will chronically put pressure on your pelvic floor and weaken it. So we're already getting slightly weaker with the, with the lost nitrogen. So be careful with your pelvic floor. Okay, if you do get that urgency, okay, we all know that um, some of us will find that the key in the door, the tap runs, we need to go. Um, our bladder is now squeezing and it's saying rush, rush, rush. And we bend forwards, cross our legs and we squeeze the bladder more and we go and rush. So the bladder now is telling us what to do. We should start saying to the bladder, you listen to me. Um, so you need to retrain the bladder to listen to you. And I'm sure you've noticed that sometimes when you feel like you need to go, you're out somewhere, you're talking to someone and you can't just disappear. And you notice that actually, I don't feel like I need to go anymore, that the urge goes away. And that's that bladder, um, that's that urge curve there so the important thing to do is don't respond too quickly um, when you go to the toilet normally what we do is actually um, we release our pelvic floor we don't do it deliberately it's a subconscious thing our body does it for us because our pelvic floor and our bladder work opposite each other so when we're up and about there's normal tone and tension in our pelvic floor keeps your bladder nice and relaxed when you go sit down the toilet you release your pelvic floor and your bladder says i can squeeze now but what you don't want it to do is start to being twitchy and uh, start to squeeze. There's different reasons why it can happen. But um, what we want to make sure is that we get the bladder to listen to us. We can use tightening and squeeze underneath. Uh, if we have weak pelvic floor, we can tighten it up and strengthen it. And that'll inhibit our bladder. So the main thing you do is distract yourself. Sit down, get out your phone, look at your Instagram, um, breathe normally and distract and get over that urge curve. OK, and then when you're in control, slowly go to the bathroom. So you're telling your bladder when you're going, it's not telling you. Um, if you've been recently, wait for a while longer. Don't start going uh, very often because you'll lose your bladder capacity. You, you'll want to go more and more frequently. So by emptying the bladder, you're not avoiding the leaks. You can actually create the issue for yourself. So let your bladder fill nice and slowly, take the right type of fluids and um, make sure you, you're making the bladder, bladder listen to you. Um, but again, it's due to the muscles getting weaker and also estrogen um, loss means your bladder can become more sensitive as well. So it's all to do with our estrogen again, of course. Um, there are adjuncts. These are ways of just helping. Um, so you can see on the right of my screen, that's a, um, a pelvic floor simulator. So you'd put the vaginal probe in and it'll work, work the muscles. Um, the other one is shorts and over shorts um, that you can wear. And again, you'll feel your pelvic floor lift um, periodically as it's been strengthened. So there's a lot of commitment with that. But I would tend to say if you can do pelvic floor muscle training through either strengthening or stretching, then that's the first line of treatment. And these are just um, uh, backups. And there's other ways of, of supporting uh, the pelvic floor treatment, too. The one thing I'd say, though, if you want to do pelvic floor exercises or muscle training and um, 
there's an app for that and I use it uh, even as a clinical physiotherapist um, and someone who's involved in the area you forget you're busy your, your life is busy and, and we get busier at this time of life as well so I have squeezy app on my phone it costs I think it's three euro a one-off payment and I get a notification it's time for your 9 a.m squeeze your 3 p.m squeeze and your 7 p.m squeeze so it reminds me to to do my pelvic floor work and it also there's some visual information on there so it's a one-off payment you don't have to pay monthly it's a really good way of reminding yourself what you should be doing because we all have great intentions but even even when you know what you're supposed to do in exercises you need to have some a regime around it otherwise we do forget we get busy and um, so do your pelvic floor muscle training don't let it limit your sporting activity don't just wear pads and keep changing your clothes make sure that you look for for treatment and help and it's treatable and as i said before there's um you can look for for support there as well Okay, so what's the, the take home messages here? Um, well, it's all about the estrogen, isn't it really? The first thing, but we can mitigate that. Um, obviously, HRT is, is one question. We can also influence um, what's going on by staying fit and active. And this is where, um, you know, Gaelic from others and others, fantastic. It's um, because we're doing really good work for our bone health. We're keeping strong, but make sure you're doing that multimodal exercise and that you are doing a bit of strengthening as well. Um, so stay strong with your, your muscles um bone density keep that nice and healthy strong women live longer and um, if you are at risk of anything um associated with bone health issues maybe think of getting a screen think of your vitamin d um keep exercising if you have a pelvic floor issue don't let that limit you go and look for help as well and then the last one of course is have fun when you're doing it um so that's mainly my message my key message so thank you so much for listening um, I hope that's been of some help and I'm really happy to take any questions within my within my ability. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. I am uh, I'm just going to throw on my, my video here as well. Um, I don't like uh, talking behind the yes. screen. Yes, um, yeah, listen, I, I suppose for 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 me as a as I suppose a, a lay person, um, quite so, so interesting insofar as you know when I hear the word menopause, I immediately go to pelvic floor or incontinence. I suppose the first things that come into my mind, I wouldn't have had a clue or any knowledge about the the impact that it has on bone density, particularly when um, women hit the, the the phase of menopause, like in that dramatic drop. And as you said, it does kind of plateau kind of after that. But oh, like it was it was so eye opening and stark to see that. Um, and it's, it's something that I wouldn't have ever thought of. Yes, it's a big one, actually. Bone bone health is a really big one. That's where, you know, getting protection for your bones around your menopause really key because it's what's going to affect what happens to you later on. So, yeah, yeah, no, the bone bone health is really important. Yeah, it's a good one to pick up on. Yeah, yeah. Super, super. Um, the chat is open there, folks, if you want to throw uh, anything in. Um, in terms of um, the re the recording of the, the webinar, we're going to wrap it up there. Um, hopefully, Elizabeth might stay on for a minute or two just while some questions roll in. Um, but in terms of sure. the overall um, webinar, I just want to thank you so much, Elizabeth, for taking the time um, to come on with us My this pleasure. evening. Um, like it's it's going to have such an impact for our participants to be able to watch this and for it to be a tool that they can watch back as well uh, on our YouTube channel, on the Ladies Gaelic Football Association's YouTube channel, um, as part of the Gaelic for Mothers and Others webinar series playlist. Like such invaluable advice there around um, the, the types of exercise that we should be doing. Um, very, very heartened to hear that the, the types of exercise include um, Gaelic for Mothers and Others at the forefront of it in terms of um, its appropriateness to, to uh, combating um, certain um, parts of the, of the menopause. But um, from, from, from all of us, thank you so much for, for this evening.